Welcome along to Inside the Hive. It's Thursday evening. Good to have you with us on the show. And what a seven days it's been since we were last sat here, of course, with Nigel Gibbs last week. A massive show on the way for you tonight. We're going to be hearing from new signing Samuel Kalou. We've got a 60-second challenge on the way with Tom Cleverley. But of course, something that I'm sure most of you have tuned in, especially for tonight as well. We're going to hear exclusively for the first time with new manager Roy Hodgson. So make sure you do stick around for that. Of course, I can't do this show on my own. There's only one Watford legend I'd be happy to do it with, and that's the legend that is Tommy Mooney. Tommy, how are you? Very well, thanks. Good evening. How's your week been? Very good. Game golf yesterday. Nice. How'd you get sunshine. on? Uh, not too bad. Okay. Not too bad. Okay. Um, let's reflect a little bit on the last seven days. Um, something very special, of course, ahead of our match against Norwich, of course, was, was Graham Taylor scarf day. We spoke massively about it last week, but you were inside the stadium last Friday night. I know the result wasn't what we wanted, but before the match, incredibly special as always. Yeah, I think you can see the, the love that, that the supporters have for, for the gaffer, as, as I would call him. But yeah, quite emotional scenes. And I think obviously because we didn't have it last year, it just meant all the more to, to a lot of the supporters. So yeah, very fitting. Yeah, no, it must be. And uh, I know lots of people commenting on social media, they were sharing stories with each other in the stands, which I think is incredibly important and very, very special. And of course, it was a bit of a special day for you as well, uh, because uh, something special was un unveiled last week, which was very, very exciting. And I think we're going to take a little look about that in just a moment's time. But um, pretty special to have your face on a mural. Incredibly honoured with the other the, the other ex-players that, that are up there. So yeah, I delighted to, to finally go and see it. I'd heard a little bit about it. Um, and, and like I say, really pleased to, to be involved with it. Okay, well, let's take a look at it then. I've not seen this yet either. So for the very first time, let's check it out. This is the start of the journey. So obviously a lot of fans coming in, I guess, from the town centre. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and the away fans as well, people coming off the train. So we wanted to give them that experience as they're walking through here, going through it, and then obviously on the way back as well. So. You can have a look on this side. So we've got Duncan Wellborn. And then, I don't know if you know this guy. <laughs> it's pretty big. Is it big enough? Wow. If you didn't have a big head you have now. <laughs> I mean, I'm not the best looking bloke in the world, but when you've scored a goal like that, that season in that kit, I played centre half. Right, okay. So that's what makes me think it was the Bristol Rovers one when it was like a, a winner late on. From different angles, it looks different as well. And it's from huge. The photograph, the photo, it just the colours just look fantastic. So that took um, so it's three days from start to finish on both of, both of these together. So yeah. Hugh worked on it, done both of them at the same time. I love it. It's brilliant. I probably had that panini that's, sticker to be fair. That's like a Hollywood look for Gibbo, that isn't it? <laughs> that's a point, yeah. With the with the barnet, yeah. We, we chose a different picture to what come with that sticker, didn't we? Yeah. I'm glad mine hasn't got a fringe on it because that was too long ago. It's huge. The different generations work so well. How big do you want it? I'm, I'm scared of ruining it. Oh, I'm, I'm so scared I've ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> Big fella. No worries. No, look at that bit to it, doesn't it? Everyone knows you've been down here, man. See, this Brilliant. is when you walk off, we've got to walk here. That's the thing. Yeah, something else. I'll say one. I'll be there forever. Brilliant. It's totally That's incredible. How much pressure was on that signature, by the way? I wasn't that nervous taking a penalty at <laughs> St Andrews. <laughs> no, it's incredibly honoured, like I say, but to, to see it like that, I, I wasn't expecting, I'd seen the other ones that were black and white, so I was expecting the black and white, and then it's when it's that size in, in colour, it was great, but yeah, and, and I genuinely thought I would ruin it. That's the that's the biggest autograph I've ever done as well, and on a wall. But you spell your name wrong, Baxton, because of the pressure. Yeah, that, so talented the yeah. guys there. You see the two, the two marks from your walls. Um, just really great stories. You know, Mark was born in Watford yeah. Hospital and supported the club. And um, the other Mark is a West Ham fan, so we, we won't talk about him. But <laughs> 
just just great to see and, and like I say I am genuinely honoured to be to be a part of it No, well you, well, you deserve it you're, you're well and truly a club legend not just what you did on the pitch but what, what you're still doing now especially in lockdown as well but um, incredibly lifelike as well but that's what really struck me I think the skill is incredible with, with the spray can the lifelikeness is incredible I, I actually said to them surely there must be a pen involved here somewhere along the line but I mean it's not just your basic that you'd get from a supermarket spray can. They have got a lot of gadgets, <laughs> yeah. um, but they're, they're just so talented. You know, yeah. it's, I suppose uh, Banksy's the most famous of all, but those those guys are, are, are super, super talented. We're going to see that up for auction at Sotheby soon, are we? Well, I might, I might take a few bricks out of the wall if it was worth that sort of money, <laughs> but not with my ugly face on it. <laughs> no, awesome. Look, looks incredible. A massive thank you to the guys that have put that together as well. And uh, make sure you check it out next time you head towards uh, Vicarage Road for a home game. Um, look, we can't not talk about the Norwich game last week. We have to touch on it. Um, disappointing, to say the least? Yeah, really disappointing. Just the performance. We've already mentioned, you know, you know the GT scarf day. From that, then all of the pyrotech techniques and and it just went it just went stale after after that there was no life in the performance um and you have to say Norwich you know deserved the the three points and you know with the, with everything that that's going on at this current stage of the season you, you just can't have a performance like that no Matthew what, what do you think went wrong that game because we've seen some really positive performances in the games leading up to that we'd seen positive spells in games I think that that was perhaps the most disappointing for the majority of the game, um, we didn't really come close um, to getting on top of, of Norwich, and you could see it was finely balanced. As soon as it, whoever got the first goal was going to go on and win the game. It was just, you know, sad that that Norwich went and, and cruised to a win in the end. No, yeah, and of course, um, that game did lead to uh, Claudio Ranieri leaving the club shortly afterwards. The official statement, of course, on the club website, that was the Hornets board, recognises Claudio as a man of great integrity and honour. He'll always be respected here at Vicarage Road for his efforts and leading the team with dignity. Um, obviously, the change has happened, um, and we're going to obviously hear, hear from Roy very shortly on that. Um, how do you assess Claudio's time here? I think, obviously... He, it started. We picked up a couple of good results the way you wouldn't expect. Um, certainly, Everton away was was a huge turnaround in performance, and the Man United home win. Uh, but other than that, the, the the players weren't at it for long enough periods in the games, and we didn't take our chances um, in games. We didn't actually create an awful lot of chances. Um, so you expect organisation and a little bit of fluidity into the team, um, and it just it just never came around. So it was almost inevitable. Okay. Well. The decision was made, the line has been drawn in the sand and of course the announcement that Roy Hodgson is the manager now was made uh, on uh, Monday, Tuesday and we've got an exclusive uh, interview coming up with you right now here on Inside the Hive. Roy came in and joined us a little bit earlier on in the studio today. Of course, uh, Ray Lewington was meant to be joining him as well but he's been busy at the training ground as you uh, would appreciate. There's lots of work for them to be getting on with with their first few days in the job. So uh, Roy's going to explain a little bit more about that uh, a little bit later on but I caught them up with him earlier on and if you want to put your comments, we'd love to share them on the show. Uh, you know how to do that by now. Just put a comment in the box wherever you're watching at Watford FC. Use the hashtag of Inside the Hive. Your comments and questions uh, off the back of the interview. Me and Tommy will work our way through those as well. So here it is, the exclusive interview for the very first time speaking to us as Watford manager. This is my interview with Roy Hodgson. Roy, thank you so much for joining us in the studio tonight. Welcome to Watford. Welcome to Inside the Hive. Um, I'm guessing it's been a bit of a, a whirlwind few days for you. I'm guessing the call came at the weekend. T tell us all, how it all happened. Yeah, it's whirlwind, of course, because it came out of the blue. You know, it, it's almost Monday morning, really, when I sort of got the call just asking if, if I would have any interest because uh, the, the man who was sort of inquiring through an agent friend was a guy called Luke Dowling, who, of course, had worked at the club and still had contacts with the club and still had Gino's ear, I think. So he first of all, they contacted me them on the Monday morning. Well, if, if they were to be interested, what would you do? You know, are you determined not to go back to work or could you be persuaded? And I said, oh, I could be persuaded. I'm sure now I've had six months without it and the lure of the, the pitch is always a difficult one to resist, as it were. And uh, the same evening, of course, I was meeting up with, with Gino and Scott and we were discussing the possibility and then the following day, Tuesday, I was on the training field. So it has been whirlwind 
and they've been long days, but it's been very enjoyable, both being back on the field with the players, that's something which I've always enjoyed doing, working with the players, but it's also been good, you know, working with, with, with Gino and Scott and seeing, you know, how, how well organised the club is, really. There's a quite a structure here, and of course they have a, a clear project for the club, but unfortunately to really see that project through, they've got to stay in the league, and that's, that's the major concern for us all at the moment. Are we going to be able to get out of the relegation zone and into a place of safety? And obviously from, from what you've seen, to take the job, you're obviously confident that the resources are here, the players are here, and, and with your guidance along with, with Ray, you've, you've got a really good chance. I think it's been more a case of myself and Ray having confidence in ourselves. You know, we, we believe that we do have a, something to offer in terms of you know the coaching we're going to do with the players, our ability to organise a team and to man-manage players. We believe in that. But of course, I've got no idea really how that will go down with this particular group of players because I don't know enough about them. Um, we'll have to find that out and do the very best we can to bring the players along with us and to, to buy, if you like, the message that we're selling. But we. We believe strongly that we have a good message to sell and if we're lucky the players will also think it's a good message and you know we'll be able to to bring about if you like the sort of changes we would we would like to bring and that's no reflection or no criticism in it that's gone before it's just a, you know if you've got a, a clear philosophy about how you want your team to play um, it takes you some time to sell that philosophy if you like and it's likely to be different to the other managers uh, who've been at this club or other major other clubs because every manager should really have a, a pretty clear idea of what he wants to see when his team go on the field of play. No, certainly. Um, you mentioned the structure there. Before you've come and seen us today, you've, you've been around the stadium meeting some of the staff. Um, how important is that for you to get a real feel for not just the playing staff, but everyone here at the club? It's a nice thing to do. I mean, I've got to be honest. Uh, you know, I've only got one thought in my head, really, and that is how in the next four months before the season ends, can we bring about the type of changes we would like to bring about? And there are so many people working very hard here and doing a great job, and it's lovely to meet them. But I would lie if I was saying that I have an interest in sort of pursuing that side of things. As far as I'm concerned, the club is the playing staff, it's the people above me, it's the people with whom I work, the other coaches, the medical staff, and we're the ones that have really got to put the blinkers on. And I'm sure everything else at the club works very, very well. It's a very impressive place. The stadium is impressive. The training ground is very, very impressive. Uh, certainly better than many I've been used to in the past. And so as a result, that side of things, that exists, that's there. Uh, that's, that's a joy, as it were. But unfortunately, that doesn't help us win football matches and that doesn't help us get those points we are going to need so that when the season finally ends, we are above the line and not below the line. So it's a, it's a very blinkered approach, I'm afraid. Mm. How's your first few days been out on the training pitch? We've seen some great images on, on the social media channels of you getting to work already. Um, yep. What's the reaction been from the players? Are you pleased with the energy, the enthusiasm and their, their willingness to listen and learn from you? Yes, I am pleased, although we haven't really put them to the test yet because the first sessions have been a little bit more generic than I think they're going to need to be if we're going to get across the, the thoughts we have uh, with regard to how we would like to see the team play with the ball and how we'd like to see the team play without the ball. So we haven't really got down as yet in any great detail to that. Uh, so I'll have to sort of hold fire on any judgment there. But if I was just to say, uh, am I impressed with their enthusiasm and, and their work ethic so far? Yes, I am. Um, is there talent in that squad of players? Yes, there is. But I'm only saying things that everybody knows already. And furthermore, I've, I've had the chance in the last six months from afar, really, without any particular vested interest in watching manager after manager saying the same things about the importance of work rate, the importance of working hard, the importance of believing in the shirt, etc., etc. But I'm really quite prepared at the moment to leave all that behind and just see that what is the nitty gritty when we're on that training field with them and what is the nitty gritty when they actually do put the shirt on and then go on the field to play because 
it seems we all say the same things. Mm. Uh, it, it becomes a mantra, but in, in many occasions it's a, it's a meaningless mantra. No, for sure. Obviously, when you come into a new club, something I, I love with this show is that we can get some real insight from former players and from managers like yourself as well. Your first day into a club, and traditionally, if you're coming in as a manager midway through the season, it's because something hasn't gone well previously, it's not gone quite right. That kind of first day, do, do you do any reflection with the players on, on what's passed? Obviously, coming in off the back of that defeat to Norwich, or is it just literally you draw a line, it's a clean slate, and it's just from day one, this is what you would like? Well, absolutely. I mean, I, and what's more, I don't ever go into clubs either giving any particular speeches beforehand. It's just mainly introducing yourself and saying that, you know, you're looking forward to getting down to work and let's get on the field and, and start as soon as possible. I'm very anxious not to make any comments about what's gone before. I, I hate um, any reference to previous managers and previous regimes. I really hate that. Um, we've all been there. We, we know what this job is. Uh, it's a hard job to survive in if the team isn't winning and you're getting successive defeats. But that isn't necessarily, necessarily a, a criticism, particular, particularly of the manager and the work he's done. He might have actually done quite good work. You just don't know. Unless you're in there and you really are seeing what work is being done and how things are being organised, you you've got no idea. And interviews will never tell you that. And players will never tell you. You know, because players, they'll have lots of opinions about the managers and coaches they work for. But if you interview them, you'll never know what they think. Mm. They will give you the standard reply. So I tend to make certain I don't get involved in any of that at all. As far as I'm concerned, this is the group of players. This is what we want. This is how we want to work. These are the practices. This is what we want you to do. And then we look at them and see how they're doing it. And, you know, both Ray and I are very encouraging coaches. We coach much more by saying well done than that's something you shouldn't do, uh, but that's nothing new. Now that, for me, that's been 45 years plus of doing that. Mm. Let's talk about that relationship with, between you and Ray. Of course, you've worked together for a number of years. Sometimes you've gone into a club just on your own and, and you've taken control of the coaching and everything, but you seem to have a great relationship with Ray. How did that all come about and how did that start? Well, it, we, we, <laughs> if you really want to go back to the, the very first meeting, it was when he was playing for London schools under 14s or 15s and I was I was coaching them at Barn Elm. So that was the first time he was one of the players with Teddy Maybank and one or two others who were representing London schools and I was being shipped in by the FA to do a coaching session with them. The second time was when he took his preliminary badge when I was sent by the FA to examine uh, the course and I remember he he and uh, Ray Wilkins were two of the star men on that prelim badge course. But then, of course, we bump into each other every now and again. And then I met him to work at Fulham because I went to Fulham and I went on my own, basically. And there was Ray. I brought a guy called Mike Kelly in who'd been working sporadically with me as a goalkeeper coach, but someone who's better than a goalkeeping coach. He, he's a good outfield coach as well, but he's, he was a, spe a specialist goalkeeper coach. So he was going to come with me because they didn't have a goalkeeper coach at the time. And um, Ray was there, which was just fortunate. And he'd been latterly brought up to work with the first team, um, which wasn't the case at the beginning. I Sanchez hadn't had him there in, in, in the beginning working. But Chris Coleman, when he came in, had brought him up for a short period of time. And uh, that was it, you know, there he was. We made contact again. I've always admired him as, as a coach and the work he does. We got on well. I then moved on. I moved to Liverpool. I moved to West Brom. But then when I got to England, there was an opportunity again to choose a coach. I chose him. And luckily he could come with me. And then that carried on into Crystal Palace. So the last eight of the last nine years, if you like, we've worked side by side, four years at England and four years at Palace. I presume it was your phone conversation to him after you got the call from Watford saying, how do you fancy it? How did that conversation go? Yeah. Well, you know, Luke and, and the guy who, who was representing, you know, the, the, the agency who had put the name forward, um, he asked me, well, what about Ray? I said, I don't know. You know, I said, oh. he said, would you take him? I said, yeah, of course. You know, if we can, if we, if we can take him and he wants to come, that's great. Um, so that was when... I said, well, do you want me to sort of sound him out? 
because the other question was, well, if he won't come, will you go on your own? And I said, yeah, I will. You know, if, he, if he won't come, I'll come on my own. But I'd much rather come with him because, you know, he's, a, he's someone whose ideas are absolutely in tandem with my own and someone who knows the way of working and will make life a lot easier for me in this short period of time to get the wheels rolling. And luckily I called him because, like me, he wasn't that unhappy, uh, you know, in this sort of semi-retirement position. So I was a little bit concerned. He might say, no, I'm perfectly happy, thank you very much. I'm happy where I am. But luckily, the lure of the pitch, the siren song from the mermaid, that actually uh, encouraged him as well. And next thing you know, here we are, talking to you. Amazing. Um, what's your family's reaction been? Because obviously you've had that time and we know how immersive the job is as a manager and you've had six months to spend with, with your family. What was, mm. what was their reaction when you said, I've got another job? Well, my son lives abroad, basically. You know, he's not, you know, he's resident, he's an English resident, but he lives a lot of the time abroad. Um, and he's very keen on following my career. And I think that he was a little bit uh, ambivalent about it. You know, I think he was pleased I'm pleased you're going back and please go and know how much you enjoy working but I think you might have been a bit ambivalent you know why why do you want to put yourself to the test again you know why are you a glutton for punishment why don't you just rest on your laurels a lot of nice things have been said about you do you really need to do it but he certainly didn't make any attempt to dissuade me and my wife the same she didn't want to dissuade me at all you know she realizes that the lure of the field is a strong one and it's one I've always been having to fight to ignore. So she was happy, and especially in this situation. I mean, it's a very specific job. In four months, I've got to try and work very hard with Ray so that when our time here expires after four months, I'm leaving a club in the premiership. So, you know, that that's, it might have been different if we'd have been approach, approached by a club that wanted us to take on a three-year project. Who knows what we'd have said? But this one was a, a very easy offer, I think, to accept and we'll see where it takes us. I mean, I'm not saying that, that that's how it will be. And after four months, I've made up my mind I will never work at Watford again. I'm not saying that. But at the same time, I really am saying I don't really worry about that moment. When the time comes, we'll talk about it. No, for sure. You, you obviously mentioned, you know, you've had a fantastic career. You know, some of the sides you've managed, England manager, um, you've coached all around the world as well. What is it? that lure that keeps pulling you back? Is it working with the players? Is it a match day? What is it for you that is that yeah. real hook? I think it's a very good question. I mean, it's something which I have thought about. It would be a very difficult question to answer off the hook without having any some thought. I think the major thing, even more than the match day, is working with the players on a daily basis. On that training field, getting to know them, getting to sort of see how they react to your coaching methods, to, your, to the ideas you're trying to sell them. You know, Getting to know them, really, the, the, the man management, human side of things is something which I've always really taken very seriously. And so it's given me a lot of pleasure. But of course, match days are special too. You know, football is a, an adrenaline fueled game. And when you, when you don't have that adrenaline fuel, if you like, on a Saturday, you know, you're, you're sitting at home and you're not there preparing for the game, it would be a lie to say, I don't miss it. You do. But we all come to terms, I think, uh, in a time in our lives, you know. I had a phone call from a, f a very famous manager, a, a friend, who jokingly said, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to break the world record? And am I going to see you at your next game when you reach 100 or something? You know? <laughs> that isn't the case, in actual fact. That isn't. But, uh, yep, yeah, both of those two things you mentioned are, are, are the real lure that keeps me going and keeps me accepting offers like this one, which I'm grateful to have received. Mm. You've obviously been keeping an eye on the results and how teams are doing over, over those oh, last yeah, six yeah. months for you. Um, how do you assess Watford season so far? Yeah, well, I wouldn't do that okay. because I mean, I have, I can't say I've not seen any Watford games because there's been some on the TV. Mm. But when I've been watching the game, I've been watching it from a totally neutral point of view. I haven't been trying to study it. And quite frankly, when you see as many games as Sometimes I have, you know, someone says to me, did you see the game last night? And I can't remember which two teams played, let alone anything else. So I would lie if I said, yes, I've been studying it and, you know, I've seen all the games and I know what's going on. I've learned a lot, 
in the few days from talking to people at the club. I've learned a lot from uh, a conversation with Gino, who's tried to fill me in as best he can uh, as to what he thinks has been happening so far. But of course, he wants me to look at it through my eyes and through fresh eyes. But it, as background information, the meeting, a long meeting I had with him yesterday was very useful. Good. Um, obviously, I mentioned that management, it's a very immersive job. It takes a lot of your time. What, what would a, a typical day for you going to look like uh, over the next couple of weeks is building up to that yeah. first game? Well, I mean, it'll be, it will be immersive, but that's a very good word. I'm hoping it will be a bit less immersive in these first three days, which has seen me leaving home at eight and getting home at six or seven in the evening. And that's been a bit strong, I think. Um, I'm hoping it's going to become a bit more normal than that, that you will get up in the morning, you'll be here at 9.30 for 10, 30, 11 training session. And sometime mid-afternoon, you'll head home. And there'll be an evening at least with the wife, because otherwise I think she's more than happy to see less of me. But whether she doesn't want to see anything of me at all might be... Uh, might be pushing it too far. You'd have to ask, I suppose. <laughs> um, your, the training sessions that obviously that you're going to be putting on with uh, Ray over the next few weeks, um, how does that process begin? Because you're coming into a team, you're, you're learning their characters as well. Do you work on, is it patterns of play is a big thing for you? Is it about just drills? What, what's kind of your style of coaching that you like to employ with, with a new team? Well, there's two elements to, 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 to a game of football and a team teamwork. You know, you've got the attacking side, which, you know, very much depends upon patterns of play and the movements you're looking for the players to make, the cohesive movements, which will get you into goal scoring positions. And then, of course, what the players who receive the ball in the goal scoring positions are going to be able to do with it. And then you've got the defensive side, which basically, perhaps even more so than attacking, does take in the whole team. And then you've got to try and make certain that, you know, the moment the ball is lost, your players are switched on to a style of defending, a way of defending, um, being, insure, being sure, if you like, that they know what their job is when that ball is lost, where they've got to go, whose responsibility it is to be the first man to attack the ball, where the other players are going to need to go in support how compact the team needs to be. So that's really everything that we do on a daily basis in training. And it's done largely through, through not drills so much as, as uh, functional practices, uh, where we're trying as hard as we possibly can to reproduce what will happen on match day. And as you go further forward and the players understand the basics, and I've got to work out first, are, are we in tune are we singing off the same hymn sheet when it comes to what we think the basics are what the principles are is that what you think as well uh we've got to get that right first and then as you as you get that and of course you know working four years at palace we certainly had that because the team didn't change that much a lot of the players were there the whole four years with us in fact the bulk of them were um then you can start even more looking at well how specifically we're going to fine tune it when we play this team because you know exactly what they're going to do. I think in the beginning, of course, we're going to be perfectly aware of going to Burnley, what they do and what we're going to need to do. But whether we can fine tune it in the same way as we did at Palace, where the basics were so clearly understood by everybody, because I need to know first that, that we've got the basics in place. So that will be my job. And once again, this isn't saying, and please let me emphasize, that the other coaches of Wirtis Club haven't put basics and had had the same thoughts. But unfortunately, that's of no interest to me now. It's got to be, well, now it's my responsibility, so it's got to be my basics that they understand. Does it help coming in during an international break? And obviously, traditionally, I'm sure you would love to have a pre-season to work with these players, but mm. and I know there are a few, I think about five or six, maybe potentially away at the moment, mm. but obviously there's a bulk of a squad there. Is it useful having that two weeks yeah. bit of breathing space? Yes, it is. I mean, it's much better having two weeks before your first game than than one week. I've had that situation in the past where I've got into a club and then, you know, maybe on the Monday and on Saturday we've got a game. It's good that that hasn't been the case, but we are hampered by injury and in particular the players who are away with, in the African Cup of Nations, which I haven't seen yet. So that, that, that's been, if you like, a, 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 a I can't use the word a blow, it would have been nice to have them there as well. But I mean, the fact is, we aren't going to put everything right in terms of what we would like to see 
in a week anyway. But it's nice to have the two weeks at least. But it's going to be, I would say, more the end of the month. Well, if I was doing this interview with you and some of the questions you're answer, asking me, I'd, I'd be in a much better position to answer than I am today after three training sessions. No, for sure. Um, obviously, challenge accepted between now and the end of the season for you. What's your method in, in looking at those games? I, I've, I've looked at interviews of managers before and they'll have a whiteboard with all the games and they'll highlight them and say, well, that's three points from that game. If we can get a point from that game, that's good. Mm. Do you approach it on a game by game basis or do you look at a bigger picture with a challenge like this? I remember a friend of mine that I, when I was working in the UAE and they asked me to recommend a, a coach for, for this particular club team, Sharjah. And they were nice people. And in fact, you know, I, I got to know one or two other board members. But he, he told me that one of his first meetings with one of the board members was that the guy actually got out the sheet of paper of the the games, and he he said, "Right, we're going there. You know, I don't think we're getting in for that one, but we'll we'll go there and we'll get a point there. And this one we're going to win." And I remember him saying, "Well, well, is there any point in me being in there? Yeah, then you know, <laughs> just you've got the points, you've got the games. You know, let's go ahead." I think, well, that's nonsense. I've got to say, I've never once done that. And I don't believe in must-win games because to some extent, if you, if you care as much about football and, 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 and playing a game of football, I mean, I, I've seen, seen players adopt a must-win attitude in training sessions, let alone matches. So I think that's all nonsense. I mean, it's a, it's a journalistic concept. As far as we're concerned, it doesn't matter whether we're playing uh, in the cup against a non-league team or we're playing Manchester City away. It's a game of football. We've got to be prepared for it. And we've got to you know, help the players prepare as best we can. And then we've got to go out and play it. So to tell them before the game, well, this is a must win. You know, we're playing, we've got to beat these three. Or, oh, Man City, it might be difficult, lads, today. Don't worry too much about it. It's a nonsense and the players wouldn't thank you for it. So, no, nope, that's something which I don't believe in at all. Um, your first game in charge is going to be obviously against Burnley, um, a team also that they want to get some points on the board sure. as well. Um, I guess that's a bit of a, would you rather have a team that's in around you? I know you've, you've just said there's no kind of must-win game, but obviously going into mm. a game where a team is in a similar position to you, um, does that make it harder to prepare for? Well, I don't know. Again, it's a little bit of a journalistic concept, you know. I mean, people are obviously going to write in those terms because that's the way people talk, you know, when they're, when they're discussing in the in the pub before the game, they're going to be saying those things. Oh, well, if we're going to Burnley, you know, we've got a good chance we should beat them or, oh, it's going to be tough up there at Old Trafford. But when you actually prepare the team to play, those thoughts don't really have any part to play in your, in your thinking. You know, what we need to, to think about most importantly, pardon me, is that we're ready to go out and play the game that we've prepared to play. And that we, as a coaching staff, have prepared the players for the type of thing they're going to meet. So if you take it very simply, if we take two ends uh, of the, the league, Burnley, who are in the bottom three, and Man City, who are the top team at the, at the moment, that's two very different things you have to meet. You know, you won't have to worry quite so much about, you know, the ball's raining into your penalty area from, from distance or set plays. If you're playing Man City, you're going to be worried there about the way they're going to cut through you with their passing. Now, there's no uh, right and wrong way to play football. So Burnley, in the way they play, and they do it very well, and it makes them very hard to beat. That's why they're in their, what, sixth, seventh season in the Premiership in a row, mm. because teams can't beat them, because they know what they're doing, and they do it very, very well. And Man City, on the other hand, of course, they do it in a different way and they have even more success, not because the coach is so much better than the Burnley coach, it's because the players at Man City are some of the biggest stars in world football and the guy at Burnley, Sean Dyche, he doesn't have those players at his disposal. So we, we need to know what Burnley are and what they're going to do and what we've got to cope with. And we've got to know that we are prepared defensively to deal with anything they throw at us and in attack that when we get the ball we have the means to hurt them and, and score a goal and it's simplistic what i'm saying and it's almost like teaching your grandmother to suck eggs but it doesn't get more complicated than that and the more words you spill on it the more likely you could be to muddy the waters yeah, for sure 
Um, we're going to finish up with a, a few questions from the fans that, Good. that have got in touch with us. Um, first one comes from Watford FC 777. Um, they said, your management style when it comes to training, are you involved every day? Do you like observing? Do you like taking the sessions? What kind of uh, management style is it, is it for you? Do you prefer or is it a mixture of both of that? No, I take the sessions. Um, in the past, I've been guilty of, of doing too much and, and almost not delegating anywhere near as much as I should have done. I've got better at that. So we do try to involve our, our, our coaches uh, at the club in, in certain areas, you know, maybe after the warm up, some, some simple passing practices or drills. But the major body of work, if I'm not doing it, then Ray would be doing it or we'd be doing it to, together or we'd be in two groups with him working with one group of players and me working with another. But it's certainly very much a hands on. Uh, I do the work on the field and that's the way it's always been, partly because I think I'm good at it. And secondly, because that's what I enjoy. I wouldn't enjoy the managerial sitting in the office talking to to people or watching out of the window and seeing what they're doing. I couldn't do that. I'd have to be on the side involved in it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Paul would like to know, uh, what style of football uh, will you hope that Roy Hodgson's Watford are going to play? I hope they're going to play a football which will get some points and win games. Um, that's, you know, nothing more complicated than that. To win games, you've got to be good defensively and you've got to be good going forward because you can't win without scoring goals. And it's very difficult to win if you're letting lots of goals in. So that's something which everybody knows. Again, people who make those judgments, well, this is his star and he plays that way. Half the time, it's nonsense. You know, the, you know, I don't know how Pep Guardiola would play at Hartlepool. You know, that's, that's the difference. You know, we just don't know. Yeah. You know, you'll never be anywhere near Hartlepool. So how do we know how he's going to play? No, for sure. Uh, Sahel has the next question. Um, what's the key to getting best out of players? Obviously, you've worked with some of the, the greatest players in the world, especially with your, your time with England as well. Um, what is it? What's the secret for you? Is it the way, is it man management? Is it understanding how the player wants to be communicated? What's the secret? Yeah, it's a combination of all those things. I mean, you can never underestimate the man management side of things. That, that's, a, that's for sure. You're dealing with human beings. You know, you don't, you don't win and lose games on a on a magnetic board where you move the magnets around and they never make a mistake and they're never out of position. You don't win it that you, you win it on the field of play. And on the field of play, people are going through human emotions. They get tired, you know, as the game wears on, they might make more mistakes because they're, they, they're, they're getting tired and fatigue is setting in. There's all those factors to, to, to consideration. But I'm a really firm believer that the only way to give yourself half a chance winning matches is for you as a coach or manager to know that the team's going out there today and they know their jobs they know what we would like to see from them that they've rehearsed it sufficiently that they are capable now of trusting each other so when i see a situation arise and i go to do my job you know the job that i've been sort of encouraged to do and we've all agreed that that behind me the people will be locking onto that as well in the, in the same way. And in, in terms of the balance between the man management and, and, and the coaching and the understanding of the roles, I think basically all you can hope for is that you get both right. I don't know that you're gonna really succeed just by being a, a so-called good man manager. Oh, he's good with the players, you know, they like him, he, he talks and he interests in them. I don't know if that'll work. Because if they don't know what the hell they're doing when they go on the field to play, you know, it might be, they might be a bit disappointed if they let the manager that they like down because they haven't won the game or they haven't played well. But they need that other side of things. And on the other side of things, of course, if you are just, you know, treating them like robots, treating them like slaves and, you know, you're, you're just a magnetic piece that moves around after my will and, you know, after my godlike uh, intentions for you that doesn't really work either because there'll come a time when they you know they'll need some human interaction because it's an emotional game you know fo football is such a great game it encompasses it's a simple game there's no question of that uh, but it does encompass so many of the human relationships that we value so much and that's why of course it brings such joy you know you you wait till the 
season finishes, uh, you know, the team that lifts the, the championship or a team that s survives relegation even. You see the joy, not just on the spectators, the supporters' faces, you see everybody at the club gets a lift. That's what football can do for you. Unfortunately, it can cause you a lot of pain as well. It certainly can. Um, final question comes from Gemma. Um, she said, is it true that you can speak five languages? And if so, how invaluable is that for you as a coach? Because opportunity now, the Premier League, it's a very multicultural yeah. league, lots of people from players and around the world. Um, how useful is that well, for Well, I'll you? be honest with you, it's the first time in these three days that I've actually used any of the other languages that I, that I speak. Uh, it's quite amusing at Crystal, Crystal Palace. I mean, I did something, they, the, the French-speaking players, they would have a have it sometime after the warm-up, you know, you'd see him standing around and, and chatting. And I remember first day walking past them in French, they you better watch out because I can understand every word you say, and they sort of <laughs> laughed, you know. But then whenever I would, if I, if I would try to initiate a conversation with them from time, for, for, for selfish reasons, you know, maybe hadn't spoken French for a long time, I'd have a little bit of training, and I'll go and speak to X and have a little chat with him in French. They would look at me a bit astonished, first of all, but then they'd answer in English. So it's been the first time here really, because there are one or two players here whose English is at a very early stage of development. They're quite ha you know, happy to hear me you know, speak to them in French or, or, or Italian. And I had a bit of an amusement today speaking to Ken Semmet in Swedish City, because I don't think he's ever come across a coach in his time here in England or Italy that actually could speak Swedish to him. So that was, but I mean, he doesn't need that. His English is probably better than mine, but uh, it was a little bit of music, a bit of amusement for me to keep things going. So I don't, if you're going to give me five languages, you've got to add, you've got to add German to that. And that's, that is, that's not just basic, you know, that, but in, in, foot, in a football environment, I could probably get by. And, 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 and I've, I've actually lectured in German on a football matters when I was living in Switzerland. But I mean, that, that one might be, I'd be boasting a little bit too much if I said I could speak German as well, but f but certainly Swedish, English, hopefully, French and Italian I can speak. Amazing. Um, Roy, thank you so much for joining us. Not at really all. Pleasure. It. No, pleasure. Um, we won't keep you much longer because of course you want to get you home to, to see your wife this evening. Um, my final question to you is just, you're going to get an amazing reception for your first home game here at Vicarage Road. Um, the reaction to your appointment on social media has been very complimentary, especially in the world of football as well. Um, just want to finish up with, with your message to the fans because I've heard you say before that fans are such a massive part of the game. Oh, yeah. um, your message to the Watford fans? It's been probably the biggest disappointment for me, you know, that the last the last year that I had at Crystal Palace was, you know, behind closed doors and the, the fans at Palace were very important for the club, as I know are, are the Watford fans. I think all I can say to the fans is this, that I'm very happy to be here. I'm, I'm looking forward to the job and I'm confident that I can, you know, do the job that it's been set out for me. Now that doesn't guarantee we'll win the games or get the points we need, but I think the people I'm talking to, they, they fully understand that. But I think that I can promise them that there will be no shirking, if you like, on, on our side and no letting up, if you like, in our desire to get the players to give of their best on the field of play. Uh, and then in the end, it might come down to the help they can give us for the home games, because there's no doubt they, they do help. I notice that in particular when we miss them at Palace for a year. And, and also to encourage them a little bit maybe to be as kind as they can possibly be, because often, you know, I, there, are, there are cliches in football. When you lose, it's because, oh, they don't work hard enough, they don't try, they don't care. Uh, and, most of the time, most of the defeats that I can look back on and have suffered, they've not been because of that. They've been because we've not been good enough. You know, we haven't been good enough in certain areas or we haven't done our job well enough in certain areas. And, but not because the players didn't particularly want to do their job. If you're in a club where the players don't want to do their job, don't want to listen, you know, are totally, what's the word, unable or unwilling to accept that, right, they're telling me what my job is, it's my duty, you know, as, a, as an employee of this club and re representing a football club with all this work, to do the job. If you've got those players, then you, you, you're doomed anyway. <laughs> you know, 
no no club is going to survive with players who do that. Now that won't be the case here, because in all the premiers, in fact, I've got to be honest with you. I've had 16, 17 clubs. I suppose I've never come across that. We've lost for various reasons, often because maybe the players, you know, weren't good enough to confront the challenge we had in front of us. You know, when we when we played Man City and, and lost a few times, it wasn't because we got any of those things wrong. It's just that we got quite a few things right. But it still wasn't good enough, unfortunately, because the quality of their players still sunk us. So I think the fans will, if they get behind the players, will see and will appreciate what they're trying to do. But, you know, I hope they're not expecting that I don't have a magic wand. Uh, I am proud of my career. I, I'm confident uh, in myself and what I can do. But unfortunately, <laughs> it doesn't boil or doesn't manifest itself in the magic wand that I shall sprinkle over the players with the magic dust and suddenly they'll see a totally different Watford to what they've seen. They won't. But uh, we'll fight. I know we'll do that. Um, and let's hope at the end of the season I'll be sitting here with you and we'll all be in a, in a good mood and the fans will go away on holiday happy that they're going to see Premiership football again. But Please play your part, I would say. Amazing, Roy. Thank you very much. Not at all. Pleasure to have your company in. All the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Well, there we go. Exclusive there with the brand new manager, Roy Hodgson. Hopefully you enjoyed that. His first time speaking publicly, and it was to us here at Inside the Hive. And of course, you look at his managerial record, an incredibly experienced manager who's very much looking forward and relishing the prospect of working here at Watford. Very honest uh, thoughts from him there. Um, Tommy? You've just sat there and watched that back with me. Um, what's your initial reaction? I thought it was very interesting. You can see how focused he is on the short-term role. And you'd see his list of his, of his clubs and experience in different countries. I mean, you joked about the amount of clubs that I'd work for. <laughs> well, there's an awful lot more there over a longer period of time. But, yeah, I think it, I, I like the way that he's talking about functional training sessions and um, the way he talks about sharing the coaching between him and, uh, and Ray Lewington. I think that that's what's needed on, on the training ground, that somebody who understands the, the, the British game, particularly the Premier League, certainly, you know, he's, we had a very experienced manager in, in Claudio Ranieri, but Roy Hodgson's mm -hmm. certainly more experienced than, than Claudio. So I think that that's going to be key to it. And really that, short-term success that he sees is staying in the Premier League and w that's what we all talk about and, uh, and want us to achieve so that's that's the key to it and I like the way that he's thinking of it as a, as a short-term project that might be extended but essentially staying in the Premier League is the most important thing. How key is that partnership between um, obviously Ray and Roy because obviously mentioned in, in his kind of piece there he kind of picked the phone up and are you interested in Thankfully for Roy, he said he said yes, but he would have come without him if, if not. But how important is the pair of them together? Because they've got a lot of experience together. I think it would have been a far more difficult task for Roy um, if Ray hadn't come along with him. I think that that's... Ray knows the football club, um, having worked here before, has a lot of respect from the people that have, that have um, worked with him. Um, and that's going to be key to it. Like I say, the most important thing for, for the two of them is to get across the fundamentals of how Roy wants his team to play and the way he talks about the defensive units and the attacking units I like that I think it's a really positive thing and it, the, the players are going to have to work very very hard not just on the training ground but also off it in understanding what they want as a pair um, and hopefully that should bring us who are watching the games a lot more joy and, and certainly more, more points. Yeah, of course. Uh, if you'd seen on social media, we were saying that uh, Ray was going to be joining us in the studio as well. So uh, we had a quick chat uh, with Roy about that and why he couldn't join us uh, today. And here's what he had to say. Um, well, obviously, good to have you in the studio. Ray was going to join us, but unable to be here today. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, without wishing to be flippant, I mean, we've got so much to do at the moment. And he, he takes a lot of responsibility for the video scouting side of things, the video analytical side of things. And, you know, he was, you know, really, he'd settled a, a meeting, if you like, with them this afternoon to really get down to the nitty gritty that what we're going to need from them to provide the material 
uh, in videos and analysis that we're going to need to complement uh, the work we do on the training field, not, not, and not least of all, of course, the pre-match and post-match videos. So he asked, you know, to be let off, if you like. He said, you know, would you mind if, you know, you go alone? I said, no, of course I won't. If you do this and what I think you'll be able to do then, because you might find it hard to get me back again for a while, <laughs> you can get Ray instead. We look forward to that. Good. <laughs> Well, there we go. We've got, a, I think, a, a promise there from the manager that we're going to get Ray in at some stage, which is very kind of him. But obviously, you can see there's a tremendous amount of work to get to get done at all times in a football club, but especially when you're coming in and trying to get your your thoughts and philosophy across. The work's already begun on on the training on pitch, Tommy. And when when new management coming like that, what are those first couple of days like for you as a player? Well, everybody's trying to make a positive impression, both the players on on the staff and the staff on the players. And the quicker that that happens, the bit, you have to build relationships. The most successful dressing rooms that I played in are, are ones that were built upon trust. The players as a group, and also the staff and players trusting each other, vice versa. Um, and, and the quicker they can do that, then the better it is for the team. And for, for, for us to see, because we only see them in the stadium on a match day. So the sooner they do that on the training ground and the more time they spend at the training ground, and you know, Roy talks about Ray watching video footage in the analytical side of it. It's a big part of the game now, even more so since since COVID, because everybody could only watch um, opposition on on video analysis. So that has definitely improved over time, um, and something that you can do in darkness. <laughs> you know, you can take you can take your laptop home. So certainly, there's an awful lot of hours going to be involved in learning the opposition and. For, for the for the new manager learning his own what his own players can and can't do yeah, certainly and watching that footage as well though we've just seen the highlights of the, them training on the training pitch um he's a very much a hands-on coach isn't he did, did you always rea react well to a, a manager like we're seeing here with this footage now that's on the training pitch with you they got their boots on they're they're physically explaining and showing you you know that's that's a very particular coaching style well i work for the, i work for the gaffer so he, he 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 decided what we had for breakfast and what we dis, what we had for lunch too. He was just that sort of not not in a in a controlling way. He was just because he knew what was best for for his players. Um, and and Roy seems in that mould. In fact, he actually uses the gaffer's expression of "give of your best." Um, so he's got me on side already. <laughs> um, so I I think that that's that's going to be important. But like I said earlier, I think Ray's, Ray's going to be key to it because of the relationship that he'll build with players. It's easier for a, a first-team coach or assistant manager, whatever you want to call them, it's easier for them to have discussions with players sometimes than it is for the head coach or the manager. So that, that the, the two of them as a, as a pair and their relationship and trust that they have in each other will benefit the players and hopefully that benefits the club on a match day. That certainly will. Um, right, let's get some of your comments. Thank you so much to all of you watching tonight and getting involved in the comments box below if you're watching on YouTube or, of course, on Twitter as well. We'd love to see your thoughts and comments. Uh, first one comes from Charlotte Gibson. She says, great to see Roy come in and do an interview in his first couple of days of the job. Uh, Alan Smith says, Roy's done it all. Hopefully he will save this season for us. Uh, Ojda says that the best man to do a very difficult job. Uh, who else have we got? Uh, Ronald's been in touch saying, I think Roy and Ray are the men to keep us in the Premier League. Thank you very much for your comment, uh, Roland. Andrew says, the guy talks a lot of sense and he'll do very well for Watford. Uh, Neil Fuller's been in touch. Uh, a really huge welcome uh, to Watford, Roy, and welcome back to Ray. As a supporter of the club since 1966, I'd like to wish you all the very best of luck uh, when you were officially announced to this appointment. Uh, I was certainly given a huge lift. And just finally, Roger says, uh, the ability to communicate and down-to-earth attitude is so refreshing. So positive comments from the fans as well, which is, uh, which is great to see and hear. So a massive thank you to all of you who have got involved tonight and sent a comment in. And of course, you can continue to do that right the way through the show. OK, uh, what should we move on to now? Uh, a brand new signing, of course, was announced uh, this week as well. So let's hear from them from the first time as well. Uh, let's hear now from Samuel Kalou. Lots of people say it's about, about the Premier League. What is it when you, you're in different countries or outside the Premier League? What is it about the Premier League that is so exciting? Uh, it's, it's amazing, you know, like very, very amazing, you know, like every game here is like the final, you know, like playing against the top clubs, 
in the world, you know, is 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 something that is great. You know. What do you know? What do you know about Watford? I I followed the club up, you know, like a couple of years ago when Odio Negalo was playing here. You know, you know, I I, I see this club as a very great club and. Uh, you know, have uh, a lot of ambitions, you know, so. Tell us, uh, tell us a little bit uh, about you. Um, growing up in Nigeria, but your first experience of uh, professional football was in Slovakia. What was that like? Well, it's, it's good, you know, I, I, I started there as a professional football player, where, you know, like, you know, as a, as a young boy, you just have to start from somewhere, you know, so you can just pick it up from there, you know, and now I'm here. So. From Slovakia, what was that like though? You were still a teenager when you went to Slovakia. It must have been a big, big move um, for you as a person, not just as a footballer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a big move for me, you know, and uh, it also uh, motivates me, you know, when I, I, I went from uh, air trenching to Ghent, you know, it motivates me that uh, I can still uh, achieve more in football and uh, go more higher. What's it like been playing in, you're saying, the, the three leagues, the Slovakian League, the Belgian League and, and most recently in Liga? Uh, they are all good leagues, but uh, I see Premier League like uh, more intensive, uh, powerful, you know, like uh, you, you know, the league you are running up and down, you know, and. I see it as the strongest league in the world. Uh, well, a very warm welcome to Samuel, of course, to the club. Another international footballer joining the ranks. Nigeria, 13 appearances uh, and two goals from so far. A winger that can play on either side. Total club appearance, 185. And got goals in him as well, Tommy. Yeah, I've, I've watched some clips of him. Um, certainly in it for playing for Bordeaux. Very similar in style to Emmanuel Dennis. Um, perhaps prefers to play off the left-hand side, but comes in on his right foot. Um, so, yeah, a, an exciting uh, attacking threat, um, similar to what we have uh, already. So I'm sure he'll be delighted to, to finally get a chance to play in the Premier League. Yeah, we'll see, of course, the transfer window coming to a close in the next couple of days. Um, some good additions to the side in January? Yeah, I think balance. Um, certainly with a left-back and a left-sided uh, centre-half. Um, and then obviously the holding midfielder. Uh, we've got players in that area, but with Lucer away at the AFCON, um, obviously that's, that was, it was good timing. But I, I, I would imagine that we're pretty much, pretty much done now and, and, and Roy Hodgson will, will, will know what squad he's got and focus on that because we will have a very, very difficult time from now until the end of the season. But it is that short period of time. So hopefully we can get enough points on the board. No, certainly, of course, uh, the manager's got an international break to work with those players over the next couple of weeks. And that next action will be taking on the first game for the manager will be, of course, versus Burnley. Saturday the 5th of Feb. Fingers crossed, Tommy, you're going to get to this one this time. What's this? Fourth time lucky this season now on this one. <laughs> Six o'clock kickoff for that one. Uh, and of course, you can keep up today with all the exclusive build up to that. And on the day, commentary with Tommy on all of our social media channels as well. Uh, the women are in action on Sunday the 13th of February, 3 o'clock kickoff for that one. If you want to see Gifton and the women's team in action, that's uh, kickoff at 3 o'clock at Kings Langley FC. Tickets.watfordfc.com to get yourself involved for that one. And there's a 25% off sale on Kelmy. Uh, that's happening in the shop until the 31st. So get yourself involved in that. Shop.watfordfc.com. Uh, so coming up uh, in the next few days or so, we've got another episode, of course, of How Smart Are The Hornets going to be hitting that. The series, of course, available on the Official Club's YouTube channel. Uh, and you can make sure you keep up to date on the uh, Official Stake channel for the full length version of this uh, tomorrow. So do check that out. But this is another little snippet from How Smart Are The Hornets. Don't let them intimidate you. That's no, the no, key. No. My blood is boiling at the moment. <laughs> right, question number six. How smart are the Hornets? Two Watford players have first and surnames that start with the same letter. Can you name one of them? It's a great question. Oh, oh my God. God. You're right, Ben. Please remember to say your name. Oh, he's got high! 
<laughs> he's gone too yeah. high. <laughs> oh, he's missed. He's give me a chance. I'm That's back in. That's massive. That's absolutely massive. Well, at least it's not just Tommy that misses the target on that one. Hey, uh, if you want to catch the episode, as I've said, uh, check out the YouTube channel and, of course, the official steak channels as well. OK, uh, time to move on to another 60 second challenge. The leaderboard is hotting up and this week it's Tom Cleverley's turn. I'm Tom Cleverley and this is my 60 second challenge. Coaching or pundit when you retire? Coaching. Teammate with the worst dance moves? Uh, Gozzi. VAR, love it or hate it? Hate it. Best shirt you've ever swapped? Uh, stones. Last minute winner or hat trick? Last minute winner. If you could play any musical instrument, what would it be? Piano. Morning person or night owl? Morning. Dream dinner guest? Uh, Bex. Best stadium apart from Vicarage Road? Uh, Tottenham. Long distance runner or short distance sprinter? Long distance run. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Favourite song? Oh, oh, pass. If you could change position, where would you play? Striker. Favourite food? Pasta. Best dish you can cook? Uh, pasta. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Favourite sport other than football? Golf. Most famous person on your phone? Rooney. Football manager or FIFA? Uh, football manager. First football boots? Puma Kings. Team you supported as a kid? Bradford City. I've never seen Gozzi dance, by the way. <laughs> well, there we go. Uh, another edition of the 60 Second Challenge. Tommy, you're still joint fourth. You're, you're doing all right. Top five. Still in the top five. You're still in the top five. That's the important thing. Uh, right, let's uh, have some more of your comments uh, and reaction to, of course, our exclusive interview with the new manager, Roy Hodgson, on tonight's show. Uh, you Orns have been in touch. They said this was an excellent uh, interview tonight from Roy Hodgson. Honest, practical, philosophical. Uh, fill it. I've got to talk. Philosophical. Thank you very much, Tommy. You're welcome. And hopefully uh, phenomenal. A very good pedigree. Now I'm officially even more bullish on the gaffer. Uh, Dan says, a great first interview of Roy Hodgson. Very honest. I have no doubt he'll be giving it his all uh, down to the players to buy into it. Nicholas Smith, thank you very much for getting in touch. Nicholas says, uh, one of the most impressive interviews from a Watford manager in a very long time. Nice one, Roy. Uh, Finland Hornet says, fantastic interview with Roy tonight. Can't remember when I last heard proper honest insight from a manager rather than stock answers. What a godfather of football he is. All aboard the Roy and Ray bus. Uh, and Jason says, uh, Roy Hodgson's interview on Inside the High was very impressive. The man talks so well. I'm sure he'll get them organised, if nothing else. And uh, Shahil Lumba says, uh, very impressed by Hodgson, spoke honestly, and I'm feeling positive he can turn it around. Um, Tommy, obviously, positive reaction for yourself, but really good to hear the fans on board with this as well. I think everybody just wants to, uh, honesty. And like he says, you know, it, it, you, you very, very rarely, if ever, get an honest answer out of a player in a post or pre-match interview. Very similar for managers and head coaches. But Roy today is, uh, has been openly honest. And that's all anybody can, can, can ask. You know, when he talks about um, the, the, the fundamentals of how he wants to defend um, and talks about the, the way you have to create chances to score goals. And, you know, he'll have been to this stadium many, many times. So and I'm sure Ray will have made it very, very clear to him what the club means to the supporters. So, yeah, he'll understand that pretty quickly. Amazing. He's got a bit of time to work with the players ahead of that next game, of course. Uh, international break, so no match this weekend. Tommy, plan for you? Are you going to go see some low league, non league stuff? I'll be off to another game, yeah, somewhere or other. And a game of golf tomorrow. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks for joining us again, as always, Tommy. Uh, massive thank you to you for joining us on Inside the Hive as well. We'll be back next Thursday where we look forward to having you join us again. Thank you so much for your amazing comments on the show tonight. It was a pleasure to bring you that exclusive with the new manager, Roy Hodgson. Have a great rest of your week. Enjoy your weekend and we'll see you next time.